I will talk about Cotopaxi a little bit, but um, more so about, um, about innovation, um, inclusive innovation. So if you guys think about innovation, who comes to mind? Like, who are the big innovators of today? Elon Musk, yep. Who else? Elon Musk, yes. Sorry, what was that? Amazon as a, as a, corp, as a, as a company, yep. Yeah. yeah, Wonder Woman, very good. Um, so those are, like Elon Musk is almost the, the first thing that comes out of anybody's mouth whenever I ask this question. And, and I think that's absolutely true. He's an amazing innovator. People like, you know, founders of Amazon or you could like name famous artists, right, who, who are deemed to be truly innovative. And, and it's all true, right? They are phenomenal leaders with regard to innovation. But if you define it that way and if you think about innovation in that way, it unfortunately makes it very exclusive. You're basically saying that unless you're a famous technologist, unless you're you know, an amazing artist, you're sort of not in the club of innovators, and you, you can't be considered innovative. And I really don't like that idea. I really disagree with that, actually. I, I like to think of innovation as the desire or necessity to create with constraints, to create with less. And if I think back about my own experience, having grown up in a small village in southern Germany, in Bavaria, I didn't have these technologists or amazing entrepreneurs in sort of my circle of role models, but I did have amazing innovators and creators. The first is my grandpa, Brian, you mentioned your grandfather as a role model, and I feel the same way about mine. He uh, was, when he was 18, he was sent off to Russia to, to fight in World War II and uh, almost got killed twice, first in Stalingrad, uh, where the Sixth Army was completely um, annihilated. He just got transferred uh, a week before that, and then he was on one of the last cr um, f uh, planes out of Crimea. And so he lost his life almost twice, for sure lost everything else. But then after the war, and that's a typical sort of like post-war story in, in Germany, really rebuilt from nothing and built an incredible career. He was a world traveler, built an incredible family, and was one of my earliest role models of sort of creating from nothing, creating from less, a true, true innovator in my mind. From age four through about 18, um, I spent every summer in, on a small island in Croatia where a family friend had purchased a property. It was a rundown olive orchard. Uh, you could only reach it by boat, and it was completely sort of disheveled. And over the years, we rebuilt that property, and it was the most, the most amazing experience. You know, you couldn't reach it with heavy machinery, so we just used our, our bare hands and, you know, uh, you know wood and, and stone and rebuilt all the, um, you know, the cistern and the, the you know, walls of the, the, the home there and uh, just built this amazing sanctuary, very, very rustic, but this amazing sanctuary um, with, with very, very limited resources. But to me, it was, a, it was a perfect example of like innovating and creating with less. Uh, Shelly mentioned that uh, I joined the military um, and had a wonderful experience in the sense that it was, again, an environment where you had to, the military mission of the unit I was a, a part of was, to, was search and rescue operations in sort of difficult terrains. So there was a lot of sort of survival training and uh, having to do with less, whether that is improvised field medicine, whether that is creating a shelter out of just your surroundings. And again, a wonderful lesson that, you know, innovation happens when you don't have a lot, when you have to sort of come up with solutions with constraints. It also led later, um, when I went to college, I did computer science because I loved the idea of like coding, like creating something from nothing just by writing lines of code. Uh, and then took some time off to work with a nonprofit organization in Indonesia. My wife's half Indonesian. She was working in Jakarta at the time, so I joined her. And it was a, an organization that was dedicated to the elimination of child labor on the Indonesian archipelago. It's completely underfunded, run by wonderful humanitarians, but terrible fundraisers. And during the time there, again, with very limited resources, we were able to take over 700 kids from fishing platforms and factories and prostitution back to their, their homes um, and schools, creating with less. It also then led, that thinking later on, led me to start working in um, micro-entrepreneurship and looking at micro-entrepreneurship as a means to help break people, to help people break out of sort of a cycle of poverty. And we uh, did a project in the Philippines where we saw amazing results of these, um, you know, entrepreneurs who were running water uh, filtration um, stations and various food cards, et cetera, as a means to sort of um, make a living uh, and an existence for themselves. Um, and then we did something similar in Cuba, where we uh, 
worked with entrepreneurs uh, in Havana. Um, it's a very new thing. The idea of free enterprise in Cuba is, is something very new. The government has only permitted that to happen for the last four years. And it was so inspiring to see these young entrepreneurs who were under very constrained circumstances were building these amazing um, businesses. Uh, one I want to share a little bit more in detail. His name is Elio. And he essentially built a content distribution system. It's called El Paquete Semanal, uh, the, the weekly package. Uh, so it's sort of think of it as a Netflix meets some news aggregation site like an Apple News or a Google News. And he reaches millions of households all across Cuba. Now that's impressive in itself, but it gets even more impressive when you remember that there's no internet in Cuba. I mean, sure, there are some government-controlled hotspots in Havana now and fancy hotel lobbies and a few street corners, but the average household in Cuba does not have internet access. And yet he manages to reach these millions of households. So, so how did he do that? He basically built a physical content distribution network. It works with little thumb drives that get copied centrally and then sort of this multi-level distribution system. They get passed on, somebody shows up at your door, you download the content, the next day the person comes back, you pay them and they pick up the thumb drive again. Highly questionable from a Western copyright standard, but at the same time, you can not marvel at the ingenuity of how they've built um, and how he's built that system. Again, creating with less. And that's something that we at Cotopaxi truly celebrate. We're an outdoor gear brand. We design and manufacture outdoor apparel, packs, sleeping bags, tents, etc. And my co-founder and I, we, we spent you know, a good portion of our youth and, tra and training and education in the developing world and really sort of had the same notion that we wanted to find a way to give as an organization and give sustainably. So have various grants initiatives that are, are tied to our revenue. We have a very um, elaborate skills-based volunteering program, primarily in the refugee community um, here in the U.S. Uh, and then we use our supply chain to um, have impact in the communities where we make our products. And the, the idea of creating with less, creating with constraints, was something that we tried to embed into the organization from the very beginning. We, for example, we run these innovation tournaments where we encourage our entire team to rally around a specific problem. How do we engage with our customers at our events or how do we um, you know, increase profit margin or whatever it may be. And you start out with hundreds of ideas. It's a concept that was developed by Christian Turwish and Carl Ulrich. They're both professors at Wharton. You start out with hundreds of ideas and then you let these ideas compete with each other uh, in sort of a tournament fashion through various constraints and you end up at the end with uh, a few very, very actionable and amazing ideas. And what I love is that the team that has come around um, and has, has come together to build the brand, not only the ones who we pay to be creative, our designers, our developers, our copywriters, not only those are creative, but some of the best ideas have come from our controllers, our events folks, uh, people who work in our warehouse. And I think that, that notion of recognizing that anybody can innovate, inclusive sort of innovation, is something that has really served us well. I want to share two examples. Um, if we could run the first video in a second of um, specific products and projects that have come out of this approach of inclusive innovation. The first is a product called the Luzon del Dia, which is a product designed by the sewers at the factory. So let's uh, take a look at that. Well, we're in the Philippines right now. We've been working specifically on the production of a new product of ours called the Del Dia, a backpack designed by the sewers of the factory. They're responsible for choosing everything from the thread color to the fabric colors, the whole colorway of the backpack. The only instruction we gave them was that no bags should be alike. We choose the scholars because I, uh, we think that those scholars, uh, when matched together, will result with a nice bag. It's made from excess material, so this is material that's either going to go to a landfill or just sit on the shelf. We decided to incorporate that into a bag. The most exciting part on the Del Dia is the process. Each person has its own free will to pick the colors. They can apply what they are feeling that day to create the bag. What's your favorite color combination? 
violet and red. The Del D is special because when the customer buys it, they're actually buying a one-off product. It was custom made. Ano sa nang bagong maganda? So ano kulay? Ano kulay ang pinakagusto mo diyan? Gusto ko yung red kasi sa yun ang love yon. Yung mga Pilipino kasi mapagmahal masyado yun eh. Gusto ko mga dark color eh. Para masayang tingnan ba? Nakakaalis ng stress, nakakaalis ng pagod. Pag nakita mo talaga yung bag, pag yung mga dark color na ganun, napapatawa ka na. Talaga napapapaismail ka na. It shows how creative people can be when given the chance. All we did was give them the opportunity to do something special. And they excelled at it. It was cool to see them kind of let go for a little while and just have fun while they're working. The function of product design is to make people happy, and I believe that it can make people happy on both sides of the equation. It can make people in the supply chain happy, and it can make people in the consumer chain happy. And I think the Daldia proves that that can happen. So we recognize these two issues in the supply chain of outdoor gear. Number one, there's a lot of waste. We have materials, trims, etc., sitting on shelves. Number two, it's sort of this black box. Consumer doesn't know where the product comes from. Is it, was it made by a machine? There's no transparency. And at the same time, the sewers have zero connection to the end consumer in you know, Western Europe and, and in the US. And so by empowering and sort of recognizing that there are creators and innovators in that supply chain and sort of giving them a voice, giving them a face, we've landed with a phenomenal product that performs exceptionally well. We've often had a hard time keeping that one in stock. Every single one is unique because, again, the sewers choose the design and the fabric that they use for, every, use for every panel. And it's just a beautiful example of how you empower, if, when you empower those who you don't typically recognize as sort of classic innovators, it can, it can result in a wonderful product. The second example is when we started the brand, we knew that we were not just going to launch Code Epoxy by spending a ton of money on performance marketing on Google and Facebook. We had very little money in the beginning. So the idea was how can we expose our customers to the brand in a genuine, authentic manner that wouldn't cost us a lot of money? And that's where the idea of Questival was born. Could you just run the second video, please? example of, for us of, of creating with less. We, we had limited resources to launch the brand. Uh, the events are net profitable. They pay for themselves. Participants purchase a ticket to get a backpack and it fully covers the cost to host the events. So it's an amazing way for us to you know, build this group of, of brand enthusiasts that are exposed to the values of the brand, of, of adventuring, of serving, of doing good over a 24-hour period without spending tons of money on traditional performance marketing. And I love when you, when you take that mindset of sort of recognizing that anybody can be creative, that it really sort of changes innovation from an exclusive concept, only the Elon Musks of the world are the real innovators, to a very inclusive concept. Everybody can create with constraints. And that's something that we truly embrace, and I think it 
it, it would be sort of the mandate or the ask to, to look for those innovators in yourself and obviously in the people around you. They, they are there because anybody can create with constraints. Thank you.